Good morning, church. Isn't it good to be here? I'm talking to the people in the room. Sorry, everybody else at home. If you're in the building today, can you give a chicken wing to the person next door to you and say, Happy Sabbath? <laughs> it is so good to be here. Um, there's been many times over lockdown where I've been into this room and just walked around and just been imagining what's it going to be like when we get back together. And um, I feel very privileged and honored to be, to just so happen to be rostered on today um, to preach our first sermon back together. But man, 2020, what a year. Yeah? Would you, can we agree that what a year? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we're saying farewell to the winds and reeds. It's, it's a sad way to end the year. But uh, I remember in one of our elders' meetings at the beginning of the year, uh, we're talking about what, what's, what direction are we going to take? Where are we going to go? And I remember Georgie shared this beautiful word, and I, 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 I just hasn't left me all year. And she said, wouldn't it be great if we could have a slogan for Lilydale Church, the year of 2020 vision? And I was just like, <laughs> looking back, it's been anything but 2020 vision. Um, I mean, let, let's just look at the year in review. We, we've had this COVID thing, right? We've been in lockdown for months and months and months, particularly here in Victoria. We've experienced it quite hard with the lockdown restrictions. Um, we've had, at the beginning of the year, and I feel like we've almost forgotten about this because how crazy the year's been, but we had one of the worst bushfires in history in this country. And, I, and my wife reminded me when I was telling her about this introduction, she goes, don't forget about the fires. I'm like, the fires. It's been such an incredible year. And, you know, being in lockdown, you know, I guess I've been watching a lot more of the news than perhaps I usually would. And, you know, I've been, you know, seeing what's been happening around the world, particularly in America, a big year over there. They too have been impacted by COVID-19. And um, we then had later in the year this uh, incident where a black man was shot or not shot, but killed at the hands of a policeman, which led to mass rioting in the States. Black Lives Matters, we had mass rioting here in Victoria and many other cities around Australia. Um, what, it's been an incredible year to, to all be ended with this crazy election over in the States, which seems to be dividing their country. And it's kind of a divisive topic to talk about here as well. 2020 has been an incredible roller coaster of a year. Not to mention the fact that maybe some of you have gone through some really hard times in isolation, being alone, experiencing feelings and emotions that we were not meant to feel in isolation. Some of you have potentially lost jobs or have had the pressure of figuring out, what am I gonna do next? 2020 has not been a great year for many of us. And it reminds me of this time in Bible history. It's the time in Bible history from where our scripture reading comes from. And thank you, Talia, for reading that. It was very done, beautifully done. But in the time of Isaiah the prophet, Israel is going through this really, really interesting season. Ahaz is the king. And Ahaz is the king of Judah. And Judah is in this really interesting situation. You see, their neighbors to the north, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel, the, the country is split in two. Israel has made an, an alliance with Syria. And Israel and Syria are trying to get the nation of Judah to join them in battle against the mighty Assyrians. The Assyrians are now the global power, or the regional power, I should say, and they are destroying everybody within their reach, and Judah seems to be coming up. And so the question is, what do you do when you are King Ahaz? What do you do when you are, you know, you're pressed against the wall, you've got nowhere to go, you have no options? It's a hard season to be a Judean. Isaiah chapter 7 is a beautiful passage, and we're going to journey from chapter 7 into chapter 9 this morning. So if you want to follow in your Bibles, by all means, uh, open, them, open it up. But in I Isaiah chapter 7, we see when King Ahaz gets the news of this, this, this war that is coming to his doorstep. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 2, it says, The news had come to the royal court of Judah, 
Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear like trees shaking in a storm. I love when the Bible uses metaphor because when the Bible uses metaphor, it's not like a newspaper using metaphor today. When the Bible uses metaphor, it really is trying to make you understand, dial up whatever emotion you imagine these people are experiencing by a factor of 10. And so here the writer of the book of Isaiah says they're they're trembling like trees shaking in a storm. I just had the privilege of having dinner with the Crofts in our YPW and Woody and Faye earlier this week. And Rosie, you showed me that picture of, of that storm that came through the cyclone you said that came through. I didn't know there was a cyclone that ever came through Victoria. Cyclone came through, trees dropped onto the Crofts home. I was like, what? This is incredible. But it, when I was preparing for this message, it made me think of that. This is how these people feel. They're they're just petrified of what's coming. And maybe, I don't know if we felt petrified this year, but there has been a deep sense of not knowing. As leaders, it's really hard to lead when you don't know what's coming next. It's hard to know, what are we going to do for church? How we, what's the next step? When you're running an AV team, when you're leading a church for the first year as a senior, you haven't been there for 10 years, it's a really hard place to be. And so, friends, the nation of Judah is struggling what happened? Second Kings gives us a little bit of a picture of what's also going on. So I'm going to jump in and out of there during this message. But in Second Kings 16, we see what happens. Then King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel came up to attack Jerusalem. They besieged Ahaz but could not conquer him. At that time, the king of Edom recovered the town of Elath for Edom. He drove out the people of Judah and sent Edomites to live there. And they do to this day. It's a bad situation. War is upon Judah. War is up to the gates of Judah. People have been displaced. People are out of homes, out of their livelihoods. It's a really stressful time. And so what do you do when your Ahaz... What do you do when you're confronted with this situation? How do you work through this season of so many unknowns, with so many enemies on your doorstep? Well, Isaiah comes, the prophet Isaiah comes to Ahaz, and he just tells him, this is what you need to do. In Isaiah 7, verse 10, it says, Later the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Isaiah has said to to Ahaz, it's going to be okay. Just ask God. Just talk to him. He really, really wants to talk to you. Make it as difficult as you want. If you need a sign from heaven, ask for the moon. God will give it to you. As high as heaven or as deep as the place of the dead, Ahaz, whatever you want, just come to God. He is so willing to help you right now. He is so keen. And friends, we need to know that in our times of trouble, in our our moments of despair, when when we seem like everything is lost, God is inviting you to trust Him. God is inviting you to follow Him. But what does Ahaz do? Verse 12 says, but the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. I mean, come on. Really? It's there on a platter. God is saying he will do whatever it takes to convince you that he is on your side, Ahaz. You just ask him and he'll show up in a miraculous way. And Ahaz says, don't worry about it, Isaiah. I've got it. And, you know, this challenged me because if I look through this year, there haven't been moments, there have been moments where I've turned to God, but there have definitely been moments where I've sort of been trying to plan my way forward, figure things out, sort it in my own strength. And Ahaz, you know, sometimes we look at the people and the decisions they make in the Bible and we're like, man, that's so dumb. But if we only just reflected on our own decision-making processes, we'd find that we're not too dissimilar. And so Ahaz chooses to go his own way for some short-term gains. 
In, in 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 7, it says, King Ahaz sent messages to T- King tiglath Pileser. what a name, of Assyria, with this message. I am your servant and your vassal. Come up and rescue me from the attacking armies of Aram and Israel. The prayer that King Ahaz should have given to God, he directs towards the enemy. He says to the king of Assyria, you need to help me out. He has it all figured in his head. He can see how this is going to work. If he does one plus one, it should equal two. And so he goes to this king and it turns out that this decision bites him in the backside. Now there's a whole chapter about this in in Isaiah chapter 8, the sermon's called What's in a Name, but it was just going to be too long. But the prophet Isaiah uh, prophetically names his second child Mashalel el-Hashbaz. Can you say that with me, everyone? Mashalel (laughs) el-Hashbaz. It's a really long name, but basically it's a a name, and the name basically carries this idea of a contract that Judah has given it all away, and it could have been so different It could have been so different. So in Isaiah 7, in spite of King Ahaz's unfaithfulness to God, we see God's faithfulness to Ahaz. Look at what he says in Isaiah 7 and verse 13. Then Isaiah said, Listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then. The Lord himself will give you this sign. Look, and here's some famous Christmas words. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. Don't you love that? Yogurt and honey. (laughs) For before the child is that old, the land of the two kings you fear so much will be both deserted. God is disappointed. He's not happy with the decision that Ahaz has made. He wants Ahaz to reach out for help. And the only reason it seems why God helps Ahaz is because he's a part of the family of David. You see, God, as I've learned over this year, this is a thing I've been reading a little bit more about and I've been really enjoying it. But God, when you look at the big sweep of the Bible, one of the identities that God primarily wants to be known through is this identity of covenant. This identity of a relationship that has been made and set. It's, it's, it's kind of contractual, but it's so much more than that. And David and God had this covenant that's been made and so many other people before David. And God is going to be true to Ahaz because of his love. Uh, he's going to be true to Ahaz because of his love to, for David. I'm going to quickly just read a few verses so you can just see what I'm talking about. Isaiah talks about this covenant. In chapter 54 and verse 10, he says, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My faithful love, my covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. God in this verse wants to be known as a God of faithful love. He is true to his covenant of blessing. This covenant brings blessing. In Isaiah 55, the next chapter in verse 3, again we have a reference to covenant. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. When you hear the word covenant, you need to have these words, unfailing love, faithful love in the back of your mind. God primarily wants to be known as a God who is a relational God, a God who moves on the basis of love. So many people have marred the Old Testament picture of God, and when you look at covenant, 
It's a God who just loves people so much, so lavishly. As Faye loves to say, he wants to marinate you so fully with his love. I used to be irked by that, Faye, but I've caught on to it. I love this marinating. He just wants to just fill you so up that everything about you is saturated, marinated with his love. This is the God of covenant, and this is why he's going to help Ahaz, and this is why he's going to help his church today, because he has unfailing love for every single head he gathered at Lilydale, for every head gathered at home. He has unfailing love for his church. Isaiah chapter 9, we see another name mentioned. In chapter 7, we're told about a boy who will come, and he's to be called Emmanuel. And in Isaiah 9, we are given another prophecy that will comfort the nation of Judah at this really hard time. Verse 6 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Faye, I've been driving around this week, and to get saturated in this message, I've been listening to Handel's Messiah. It's a little weird, I've got to be honest. It was written in the 1700s or something like that. It's not quite your Hillsong album, but it was okay. Um, And I've been listening to this, but you can see, I looked into the history, and Handel really just wants to convey to his community in England the goodness of God, salvation history in this, if you can quote unquote, call it his album. Okay, that's what he wants to convey. And here he references this God who will come to rescue Judah. He will be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. Verse seven says his government and its peace will never end, never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, covenant language for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's army will make this happen. And so we often read these texts, the virgin will be of child, unto us a child is given, unto us a child is born. We look at these texts with very Christmassy eyes. I don't know about you, but I love to listen, like I've I've told you, I love to listen to Christmas albums. There are as many Christmas songs in my Spotify playlist as there are other songs. That's how much I love Christmas music. Don't come for a ride with me in my car if you don't like Christmas music, just saying. But I love Christmas music. But we often think of these words in the context of the birth of little baby Jesus. I'm pointing here because when we filmed with Alex, baby Jesus was over here. Watch next Sabbath and you'll know what I'm talking about. But here's the thing, these words had an application, relevance, a few hundred years before Jesus came. You need to understand that when Isaiah speaks these words to King Ahaz, when he speaks them to the nation of Judah, these words are bringing life. These words are bringing hope. You know what, it looks like everything is lost, it looks like we're gonna lose, but let me tell you, God has not given up on you. He has sent God to be with you, Emmanuel. He is going to send a boy into this world, and this boy is gonna change the world. Now, who is this boy? Well, history tells us that this boy would go on to become young King Hezekiah. That's not who we were expecting, right? But remember, this prophecy has an immediate application. And I'd just love to read a little summary of Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 18. Verse 3, it says, He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And this is unique for kings of Israel and Judah. Not many of them do what is pleasing in God's sight. He did this just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the pagan shrines, he smashed the sacred pillars, he cut down the Asherah poles, he broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. Verse five, and I love this, friends. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. You need to know, friends, Hezekiah gets thrusted into this world. Yes, you know, the enemies eventually get squashed, but they still have the Assyrian army on their doorstep. They still have the Egyptians to the south. Hezekiah can easily make the same decisions that his father did. 
but Hezekiah chooses to walk a different walk. He chooses to talk a different talk. He chooses to trust in God when all of his father's household before him, bar David and a few others, have, have, have just walked and given up on him. Hezekiah trusted in God, the Lord of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed the commandments of the Lord um, the Lord had given to Moses. Hezekiah is a good guy, and his coming into the world brought major hope to the nation of Judah. But friends, Hezekiah isn't perfect, and it's another sermon to look at his fault and his failure. But know this, he is better than most. And so if Hezekiah isn't the, isn't the king that everybody hoped he would be, he was better than most, then who are we expecting? Well, this is where the story of Christmas comes into it, doesn't it? This is where we know the end of the story. This is when we know that Jesus is coming, a better Hezekiah, a better David, someone who is really going to be faithful to covenant, better than any of these two kings were. So what should we expect from this better king, this better king than Hezekiah. I'm going to invite the, the, the musos to come up while we just sort of close this up. The Bible says the government will rest on his shoulders. This king, friends, need to hear this. This king is going to be so countercultural to all the other kings that have come before him. He is going to carry governmental structure upon his shoulders. He is going to be a wonderful counselor. Some theologians have described this king that would come in the future as a philosopher king. The last philosopher king was, was um, Solomon. We haven't seen a king quite like him yet. But the difference between this king and Solomon is that this guy is going to counsel in all truth, in all principles. He's going to lay the foundations with his words of a kingdom that looks so different from the Assyrians, from the Israelites, from the Judeans, from the Egyptians, from any other kingdom, this kingdom is going to be so drastically different. This new king is going to be the mighty God, the everlasting father, something Hezekiah could never be. He is God incarnate from eternity past. He has been at one with the father. He knows the father's heart. This king is going to be the prince of peace. And yes, Hezekiah's kingdom had peace for a season, but it wasn't long enough. And friends, I'm looking forward to a time when we will see peace from all of earth's calamities, from fires, from, from viruses, from bad politics. I'm just looking for a season of peace. Are you? We are all longing for that time. And we are still in the night yet. Jesus has brought in those principles. He's ushered in this kingdom. And it's up to us to start convincing other people that it's worth investing into this kingdom. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The goal of this kingdom is so fundamentally different from every other king kingdom Ahaz thought he knew how to play the game of kingdoms. Hezekiah realized you need to tap into God's way of doing kingdom. That is the best way. And friends, as we come to this Christmas season, we are in this Christmas season, I want you to remember that the Jesus we celebrate, the Jesus that came some 2,000 years ago, his kingdom is so vastly different. It's so easy to get caught up in the politics of the day, in the talk of the, of the news. But friends, we serve a God who's so much higher than the news, than the politics of the day. His ways are so much better. And friends, we need to remember this as we go through this season because it's so easy to fall in the trap of Ahaz and go our own way. Luke says in chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, this king, he's ta an angel's talking to Joseph, he will be great, he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Amen. 
Father, thank you for the words of this beautiful song. It just sent chills through my body. When the oceans rise and, the, and there's thunder all around and it's noisy and it's loud, you will be the peace through the storm. Help us to not forget that. A has lost sight of that. He lost sight that you can do mighty things when we place our trust in you. Help us to remember that you can provide peace through all of life's circumstances. No matter what the enemy throws up against us, you are a God of peace. You are a God of covenant, a God of unfailing love. You want to enter in covenantal relationship with each and every single one of us today. And we know this so much so, you sent a little boy into the world, a little boy who would grow up to die our place on the cross, the place we deserve to be in. Father, thank you so much that you provide peace through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we proudly sing these songs because we have faith, because we have hope in what you can do through your your amazing son, Jesus. My prayer, Father, is through this Christmas season that we would wake up and remember the reality that we have a God who is there to help us through all of life's circumstances. Father, help us to not only re- remember this for ourselves personally, but help us to share this good news with our friends and family who need it most. There is a world of hurt, Father, as, and as we come back to normal, whatever that looks like, Father, we are going to see the remnants of this year. There are going to be people in 2021 whose lives are still being put back together, who are experiencing experiencing brokenness, losses of job, mental illness. And Father, we as a church can be a light that says, hey, my God can stand any storm that you throw at him. Give him a go. And so Father, be with us to this end. Bless our community. Bless all of our leaders. And Father, we look forward to an amazing 2021 and to see how you will work in a mighty way. Thank you for listening to our prayer. We prayed in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let the church say, Amen.